If you have your Bibles, you can turn to Psalms 190, I'm sorry, 139.13, and um, we're going to look at uh, what the Bible says about how, how much thought went into when God made us and created us. How many know that you came from God? How many know that you didn't come from a monkey? Well, you're way ahead of the game. <laughs> right? I mean, you, how many know that all this design, all this creativity that we see didn't come from nothing? Amen? Came from a living God. And guess what? This living God wrote us a book. Amen? Amen. Amen. A supernatural book. A prophetic book, a book full of power, a book full of life, because every word in this word of God is, is faith seed, and it produces mountain-moving faith in our lives, and, and God gave it to us. This book is God's autobiography. There's a lot of cast of characters in the word of God, like David and Elijah and, and Paul, but there's only one main character. His name is the Father God and Jesus, right? And you can find yourself in here, and you can... Take every word that's here, and you can take it to heart. And so that's why we bring so much uh, scripture into play whenever we teach. Look at Psalms 139, 13. It says, you made all the delicate inner parts of my body and knit me together in my mother's womb. Now, this is David. He's getting an insight into how special he is. There's a reason why the Bible said that David was the apple of God's eye. Amen and a man after God's own heart. You know, this comes from a time where most of the people in the Old Testament, they didn't know God like David did. They didn't have that, that sensitivity and that delicacy of knowing the intimacy of God. They just, they just knew him as under a law and, and, and source. David knew God on a supernatural level, and he's praising him that he is somebody. In God's eyes, you're all somebody. Maybe somebody has treated you like you're not somebody, but what do they know? They're not God. And besides, hurting people hurt others. Happens all the time. The main goal is don't let the hurt that's in them get in you. Amen. You've got to block that off and seal that off with the love and the, and the nurture of your heavenly Father. If God loves you and you know that and God's there for you unconditionally, and God's, God is always, he's the God of second chances, third chances. If you know that he's for you, not against you, that, that's, the, that's the anchor that you need. A lot of people don't even know that much. Look at verse 14. He says, thank you for making me so wonderfully complex. Your workmanship is marvelous. How well I know it. You watched me as I was being formed in utter seclusion, as I was woven together in the dark womb. You saw me before I was born. Every day of my life was recorded in your book. Every moment was laid out before a single day had passed. How precious are your thoughts about me, O oh God. They cannot be numbered. I can't even count them. They outnumber the grains of sand. And when I wake up, you are still with me. Did you catch that? He said, how precious and how wonderful are all your thoughts about me, Father. There's so many of them. They're more than the grains of sand. And when I wake up, you're still with me. Wow. I'll tell you what. God will be with you through the fire, through the trials, through the tests, through the tribulations. But the key is, make sure you don't get in those outside of God's will. He'll come get you, but God, God, God will keep you out of a lot of things if, if we just hear what his word says. Amen. Amen? God cares about you. You know, there's a term called helicopter um, parent. I haven't heard that word in a while. Would you ever hear that term? Parents that hover over their children. And they'll just watch everything they do. Not in a bad way. That's, you should do that. Well, God's a helicopter God. I mean, he wrote you a book, right? He inspired it by the Holy Spirit. And he give, he's given you his spirit. He put his spirit in you if you're a born-again believer. He's your guide. He's your counselor. He's the one that leads you and, 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 and bears witness with your spirit. I mean, God's got it all set up. But we have to get involved in his game plan, not our game plan. So many people, they make their own plans, they want to do their own things, 
and God's the last person they ask. What if your plan isn't part of God's plan? Stick with God's plan for your life because it's already blessed. You don't even have to ask for a blessing for it. It's already there, right? And so in our culture today in America, here's, here's what's hurting the hearts of a lot of people. We're losing our, our dignity as a people who are made in the image and the likeness of God. Everything's pushing against where there's no dignity there. People are, 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 are walking around not knowing how precious and how valuable they are, not knowing that they were created in the image of God, not knowing that God loves them, and they're being taught something completely different. And there's no, there's no dignity there. And then because they get outside of the word of God, there, there's no object morality. In other words, they follow their own truth. I got a truth. It's right here. They follow their own truth. And the Bible says that when, when they pull out of God and pull out of his word and pull out of his spirit, then they'll make up foolish ideas of what God's like. Anybody see any of that going on out there? Foolish ideas. And, and, and it leads them down paths that are destructive. So morality, the definition of morality is principles concerning the distinction between right and wrong or good and bad behavior. The principles concerning the, the distinction, it's the key word. There is a distinction between right and wrong, amen, and good and bad behavior. Well, where do we get this distinction from? Right here. It's called faith in God's word. But the world has made up their own morality. You know what they're lost in? Self-righteousness. Self-righteousness, that'll get you nowhere. But the righteousness of God that came to us through Christ Jesus gets you everywhere. And I just read to you in Psalms 139, if you could apply that to your heart, God loves you as much as he loves anybody else in here. He has plans for your life. He, he formed you in your mother's womb before you even came to this earth. He knew you. He knew everything about you. And his love is unconditional because God doesn't just have love. He is love. So his love will never change. The key is to getting God's love in you now so that you can help a lost and dying world with the love of God that's in you. You get that by the Holy Spirit, the love of God. It's been shed abroad in your heart by the Holy Spirit. You can go out there and, and win some for the kingdom of God. How many believe that evil can get in the hearts of people? You see any evil out there? They're not coming up with that on their own. Right? It's pretty evil to do some things that they're doing. But guess what? The love and the goodness of God can get in people too. And we are that people. And so what happens when we lose this fundamental human dignity that comes from, from knowing that we come from God? I just threw out a couple examples. I could go all day long. We all know what's going on in this um, world. I hope you don't watch too much news because it's just um, it's pretty bad. But I just seen in Massachusetts, a senator proposed a bill. They're going to reduce, they want to reduce people's uh, prison sentence if they volunteer to donate their organs. There's no value sanctity for life. That's something like China does. The godless government. Anytime I ever speak of China, I want you to know I'm talking about their government. The people in there are good people, and there's probably more Christians in China than there are here. They got a lot more people. But that's something that that Chinese government will do. There's no value. Oh, go ahead and, and you know, instead of getting 20 years, you'll get five years if you, if, if you give us this organ or that organ. No, that's a human being created in the image of God. Now, if someone donates an organ, that's different. That's different if they come to a place where they can help somebody and they come to a place where that, that's completely different. But coercing people and treating them like just, just like a piece of meat and no dignity? There's politicians that are all for that. And you don't have to look too hard to find out which ones they are. But lest I be accused of being political, I won't mention any names. And then they had to pass a law that aborted babies, no, no dignity, no sanctity of life for them, aborted babies don't get thrown out in the trash. 
Because that's, that's what they were doing. And they were, they get, they're buried with dignity. Or, or their ashes are taken care of with dignity. There's no dignity in the world today. No, no dignity that comes from knowing that they're created in the image of God. Because they made themselves their own God. How do they think they can fill the void in people's lives with their own power, their own might, their own strength? They can't. Only God can. And then the other example is the schools and colleges teaching children that there is no God. No higher power. We come from nothing. So they say. Well, you're basically telling them they're like an animal. What about the spirit of a man, the spirit of a woman? What about the likeness of God? What about the morality, the dignity of knowing that we all come from God? That's how we treat each other with love and kindness. And we don't break laws because we honor God and, and we follow the morality in the word of God. That leads to the violence that's out there. Violence is one of the trademarks that's happened in the last days. Violence has always been around, but it's only increasing. That's why you have kids on school buses getting in these fights and doing all these terrible things, and there, there's, no, there's no substance there because the parents don't take them to church. The schools don't, don't let, let anything Christian be in there. They're just raised without God. They don't know about the dignity. And the sad part about it is if you got some of those kids in a little setting, it probably would only take 15, 20 minutes to, to reach their heart. That's how powerful the anointing is in the word of God. But they're committing suicide. They have violence. They're, they're getting on drugs. Nowadays, the drugs that's coming across the border, I mean, those drugs kill people. All sorts of soul-crushing immorality. They made up a foolish idea of what God's like. They got their own value system. They got their own sense of what's right and what's wrong. I'm sticking with the Word of God. And you know what? I'm going to bring as many people into the light as we can. We are. You think the church isn't important? It's very important. Where are they going to go when, they come, when they're trying to find light? Where are they going to go when they want a different life, when they're searching for God? They're going to go into the churches. They're going to go in to find people like us. People to say, you know what? We were in the same situation. We were drug out of the ditch of the world. And look what God did for me. Where are they going to go? That's why the devil fights churches so hard. Fights pastors hard. Strike the shepherd, sheep will scatter. Amen? we got to stick together. we got to stand together and reach these people for the kingdom of God. This is truly a matter of life and death. We've gone far enough now, far enough into this perversion, into this wickedness of the world, far enough, you should be able to clearly see, clearly see the immorality and the perversion that's rampant in this country and the loss of dignity of being created in the image of God. If you can't see it, you gotta come, come see me and I'll pray those scales right off your eyes, right off your heart. And you got preachers all over the country that are, were mandated to preach the word of God and to come against that, those things. And then you got these preachers, they start talking. You got to talk. You, sometimes it's not, I don't preach political messages. I preach the truth of the word of God. But, but sometimes their, their, their immorality needs to be talked about. Yes. It's like, oh, preacher, you're, you're political. Nope. Not running for office. Couldn't even be elected dog catcher at this point, probably. <laughs> Too politically incorrect. Not telling you who to vote for. But I'm telling you what the word of God says. Amen? I'm telling you that there is truth. There is absolute moral truth that comes from the word of God. There's, no, there's either a truth or a lie. God is truth. God is good. All goodness comes from God. No one is good on their own. No one. No one. So when's the church going to get fired up? And when's the church going to say, I want to be more and I want to do more. I want to I just, just, just be an example. It's okay to pray the prayer of Jabez. Lord, it brought my territory. Let me be more and let me do more 
for the kingdom of God. That's a good prayer, but you've got to do it the way God said to do it, not your way. Amen? Amen? God's way is structured. God's way is disciplined. God's way is guidelines to keep us in check and to keep us growing healthy in the spirit. So we find our dignity and worth in God and in Jesus who died for us. We're wonderfully and fearfully made by God. When God created us, he created us with reverence. You were created in that womb with tender, loving reverence. God reverences you as a, as a life, as, as a being that came from him. Nothing irreverence in God does not go together. And when we know that, it's a good path, it's a good launching off period for us. Look at uh, John chapter 8. If you, said that's, if you think that sounds familiar, yeah, we've been in John chapter 8 for a little bit now. But I just want to get one more little example, one or two more little examples out of this story of the woman caught in adultery. Because there's so much in there. But I want to show you the love and the power of Jesus to set people free. In John chapter 8, this, this translation here would be NIV, I believe. In John chapter 8, verse 3, it says, Teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought in a woman caught in adultery, and they made her stand before the group. And Jesus, and said to Jesus, Teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. In the law, Moses commanded us to stone such a woman. Now what do you say? And they were using this question as a trap in order to have a basis for accusing him. But Jesus bent down and started to write on the ground with his finger. Verse 7, when they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and said to them, Let any one of you who is without sin be the first to throw the first stone at her. And again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. At this, those who heard began to go away one at a time, the older ones first, until only Jesus was left with the woman still standing there. And Jesus straightened up and asked her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No, sir, she said. Neither do I condemn you, Jesus declared. Go and leave your life of sin. Or in other words, go and sin no more. Go, this is Jesus, the Son of God, the same one that said, Lazarus, come forth. The same one that speaks with power and the whole world came into existence. He spoke life. He spoke power over her. He said, go and sin no more because you met me and only I can forgive sins. Amen. Amen. This is God in the flesh. This is the son of God who calls himself the son of man. Only Jesus can forgive sin. Only he did. When did he forgive all the sins of the world? On the cross. What's it take to, to get out from underneath sin and all that weight of that guilt and all, all those the, uh, things that separate people from God? What's it take? Faith in Jesus. Amen. I believe you, Jesus. I believe in who you are, and I accept you as my Lord and Savior. Come into my heart. Make me new in spirit. Be my Lord, and I'll follow you with all of my heart. When someone does that, they go from death to life, spiritual death to spiritual life. Not a 10-step program, one step. Amen. One step. Jesus is the answer. That's why he could set her free. I like it when it says that, that when, when everybody left, this is important, the woman was still standing there. That, to me, that means something. Because she could have left too. All of her accusers left. Jesus is still down writing in the dirt. I think, personally, I think he was right, drawing a cross. Or a serpent on a pole, as the scriptures say, or something, because that's where all the power is at and what he did on that cross. He who knew no sin became sin 
so that we could be the, the children of God. And so, but when they left, when they dropped their, their rocks, let me just t- put you in this situation. This is a real life event. Can you imagine the hatred in their hearts that they would literally throw a stone at somebody to try to kill them? She's blessed that Jesus was the one doing the speaking because he had the anointing. He cut through their, their hard-hearted hearts. Amen. Takes a powerful anointing to get through some hearts because they got hearts of stone. But the fact that she was standing there means something to me because she, she could have left too. She could have said, well, nobody's here. I'm out. Mm-mm. What did she do? The Bible specifically says she was left standing there with Jesus. She wanted him and all that he had to offer. That's the, that's the deciding point. If you don't want Jesus, he's not going to come barging into your life. That's the devil. That's oppression. The devil oppresses people with drugs and alcohol and all kinds of perversions. He gets them in bondage. Jesus waits for you to come to him. And he'll set you free. He will not violate your will. He will not violate it. So she stayed. Verse 12 is what this whole scripture is all about. Look at this. Jesus spoke to the people once more and said, he said this, I am the light of the world. If you follow me, you won't have to walk in darkness because you will have the light that leads to life. Everything about this story is about who Jesus is. Not so much about what the woman did, but who he is. Who is he? He's light that leads to life. You think he's still light that leads to life? We know he is. And so this woman, she had the double whammy. I call it the double whammy. She got thrown out and trampled on by the world. The world will do that. When they're done with you and they can't use you anymore, they'll throw you out. And then she got the accusations in the judgment of the church, the religious spirits. She had both whammies there. There was no pathway to dignity for her, no pathway to life, life, light, life, anything. She got the worst of, of, of both worlds. And you know which one's worse? The religious spirits are worse than the world. Because Jesus said the people that are under those religious spirits, which means they have a form of godliness, they sort of look like things of God and they say they are, but there's no heart there, there's no love there, there's no relationship there, there's no Holy Spirit there, and so all they do is put people in bondage and, and cut them off from dignity and honor. How many know that people like to control other people? Since her life was ruined, she had no pathway to refuge but through Jesus. But you know what? This woman, as all of us, tell me if you can agree with this, found her dignity in Jesus. Amen. She found love and forgiveness in the power of God to go and sin no more. Did she go from that point and never make a mistake and never stumble or fall? No. She walked in the light of life. She walked in the power of Jesus Christ. She walked with him from that point on. The same thing we're doing. Amen? The same power of God. Look at Romans uh, 3, verse 23. I just want to show you um, just another example. This would be New Living Translation of what the world's like today and some things we've got to deal with. There's many voices in the world, is there not? Many, many voices. All you got to do to hear them is just turn on the TV. Or nowadays, just just get on the internet. Billions of voices. Billions. All of them a thought. All of them, some good, some, some not so good. Sometimes I think, you know, in the church as a pastor, sometimes churches lose a battle, we're losing a battle, losing ground, because sometimes they'll come in and they'll, they, hear, they hear the church or the sermon for like 40 minutes, 45 minutes. Okay, a little longer sometimes, but, you know, in around there. And, and, and that's all we got. 
all week long. The information highway is pumping and pumping and pumping and pumping and pumping and pumping in there. And then it lessens and lessens and lessens the church in their minds and in their hearts. And then you get a true word out of the true anointing and it's blocked because of this. Tell me if I'm wrong. It's what the word of God says. I've been at this 20 years. I don't, I, I've seen it. Look at Romans 3, 23. It says, for everyone has sinned and we all fall short of God's glorious standard. Everyone, Amen. everyone. Hey, we're all in the same boat in that category. <laughs> Everyone has sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. There's not one righteous, no, not one. You have a holy, perfect, pure God who's able to give you life evermore and to heal you from all the destruction of the world. But, but it only comes through Jesus. The one who died for your sins. The one who paid the price. And then when you get born again, he doesn't say, okay, see ya, uh, go ahead and, and run around and do what you want. No, we got an instruction manual. It very clearly says, get into the church, the body of Christ. Jesus is the head, we're the body. In the church is where the gifts and the talents and the callings and the, and the, and the gifts of God for each other. The gift that God gave me to be a pastor, it's not for me. What am I going to do with it? Sit at home preaching to the wall? I can preach to my dogs, but they don't want to hear it. <laughs> Leslie said, yes, they do. Okay, maybe they do. All right. <laughs> what am I going to do? Go up in the mountains and say, the mountains is my church. The squirrels don't want you up there. Unless you're sitting up there and they're all lined up in a, one line, then maybe you got something. But you better take a picture of it because I'm not going to believe you. You can go into the mountains and enjoy nature and you can enjoy serenity and peacefulness, but that's not your church. There's no people there. You know what it is? Uh-oh. I'm going to have to say it. It's the path of least resistance. That's what the flesh wants to do. Am I the only one? Least resistance. Now, if you're going to go God way, God's way, you're going to make your flesh unhappy. Right? Come on now. I'm preaching good. I know I am. <laughs> so we've all sinned, right? We've all fallen short. You know what that does? That puts us all on the same plane. I, I like to be transparent when I preach up here. I like to be very transparent where God brought me from. I, I do, and, and maybe to a fault sometimes, I don't know, but I want to make it perfectly. I just want, want you to know, if not for the grace of God, there go I. I, I, have, I could never, ever in a million years stand up here if I did not know and feel and be under the anointing of the Holy Spirit to do it. I couldn't do it, nor would I do it. But when he asked me to dedicate my life to this cause, I said yes. Amen. Amen. I said yes. But I had gone just long enough in life to realize that the world had nothing for me. And the peace and the joy and the contentment and the thrill and the passion and the vision that it gives me inside, the world never gave me that. Not trying to be rich, not trying to be famous, just doing what God asked me to do makes you happier than anybody in the world. Amen. When I walk over here during the week and I walk in there and see those kids running and playing or I see Pastor Dane up here teaching them life skills and, and I see the kids coming to the Lord and praising and worshiping God, it, it, it thrills my soul. It thrills me. You find that in the world. Can't. Can you? 
Look at verse 4. Yet God in his grace freely makes us right in his sight. He did this through Christ Jesus when he freed us from the penalty of our sins. Woo. I'm right in God's sight. I don't matter if I'm right in Mr. So-and-so's sight. Mr. Religious, Mrs. Religious, they don't, a lot of religious people don't like us anyway because we believe in the gifts of the Spirit, so we're out. We're on the wrong side of the tracks. But yet they'll never come and, and lo, lay open the Scriptures and show you and build a case in the Word of God for how they feel about that, that way. We're always ready. What, you say you want to win some arguments? No, I want to speak the truth. But did he free us from a penalty of sin? Who the Son sets free is free indeed. Look at Romans 3.10. Just going up the page here. We're going backwards. Romans 3.10. As the scriptures say, no one is righteous, not even one. So I can say I'm righteous. I can say I'm righteous. How am I righteous? Through Jesus. My righteousness comes from, from my faith in Jesus. I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. I am righteous. Am I saying that I'm perfect? Am I saying that I'm holier than thou? Am I saying that I never make any mistakes and I'm better than anybody? No, we've already read that we're not. We're not that. But I am righteous in Christ. Go out there in the world and ask them if they're righteous and see what answer you get. You better be right with God in order to get to heaven. They come up with all kinds of foolish ways of what it means to be right with, with God. Some people say, well, I'm a member of the church. So what? Sometimes when we talk to the Catholics, I believe there are Christian Catholics, but I believe there's a lot, a lot that aren't. Depending on what they're putting their faith in. And you want to talk to them and they say, well, I'm Catholic. <laughs> okay, I'm John. Nice to meet you. <laughs> I'm talking to you about Jesus here. I'm talking to you about, are you the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus? Have you put your faith in him? Have you become born again? Amen. I said this before, there was a politician one time. He got pretty famous. He said, I'm a Christian, but I'm not like those born-again kind. And I thought, oh boy. <laughs> Jesus said, unless you're born again, you'll not see the kingdom of God. Amen. You, what is that? And he came out of a church for years. Lord, help us all. Don't get me started, though, because I'm teaching about something else. Man. <laughs> look, at, look, at, um, look at verse 11. No one is truly wise. No one is seeking God. Talking about the people in the world. All have turned away. All have become useless. No one does good. Not a single one. Their talk is foul like the stench from an open grave. Their tongues are filled with lies. Snake venom drips from their lips. Their mouths are full of cursing and bitterness. They rush to commit murder. Destruction and misery always follow them. They don't know where to find peace. They have no fear of God at all. They have no reverence for God. I can think of a lot of politicians and educators in, in Hollywood that you can just say destruction and misery always follow them because they're not lined up with God. They don't know where to find peace. They don't know where to find peace. They have no reverence for God. They're stuck. You know, whenever um, that football player um, had that heart condition on the field, and all everybody prayed with the Bills and the um, Chiefs, Damar, Hamlin. That was a wonderful event. You know, in crisis, in times of trouble, they instinctively 
go to God. But yet they're a part of a league where they'll, you'll get fined for praying like that. You'll get fined for not to- toting the party line. But in that case, it was okay. I'm glad they prayed because their prayers got answered. But I'm going to pray to God all the time. But we need to stand together as this church. We need to stand together united in God. Do you believe that? We need to stand with the Lord in our, in our church, in, in our um, school. The Bible says, as for me and my house, we'll serve the Lord. We can work together at this. Everyone has dignity. Amen? Maybe not in the world. They don't treat you with it, but in here, everyone deserves dignity. And so... If you feel you're not being treated with dignity in here, you need to tell me. Amen. And if you're not treating others with dignity, you're going to hear from me. Because everybody deserves dignity. Amen. Amen. The Lord showed me one time. I'm talking about our church setting and what, we're, we're, what we are in here. It was, I was just laying there, just going over a sermon, you know, just, uh, it just, he just showed it to me for however, whatever way you want to put on it. And he showed me um, a church setting where there was a man in the church that was poor. And, and he, he didn't have any money. He was like really from, just, just, you would always see him on the streets just getting cans out of the garbage to get some money. And he just didn't, didn't have much in life but then he found his way into a church and in that church he was to have dignity now this isn't this church i'm talking about right this is what the lord showed me this example but in that same church was a lawyer the lord had a lot of money gave a lot of money to the church so he sort of felt like he had extra say well number one you give it all to the lord right whether or not you become, everybody has say in the church, not just because you give money. And, and so he, he's, uh, he, he just had a problem with this guy that was poor. He just looked down on him and just, just didn't treat him with respect. How many know people know when you're not being treated with respect? And, but the guy was coming and he was growing, he was learning, but he just, he just did not feel welcome because of this man that was important in the church. And he stopped coming. Don't be the one that knocks people out of coming to church. Mm. This is what the Lord showed me. And, and so, sometime later, this man who had it all, supposedly his son, got hooked on drugs. Bad. Was down in the streets. Down hanging out in the streets. And this guy's praying and pleading with the Lord to deliver his son, this lawyer. And the Lord spoke to him and he said, you know the guy in the church that you didn't show respect to, you didn't give him dignity, the poor guy that you saw no good in him? The Lord said, within him was an anointing that I was developing and growing. He was to grow and be planted in that church. He was to have a a street ministry and he was to have the anointing to deliver your son. Then it stopped. The Lord ended the conversation with me. It's just that real, isn't it? Amen. You know what the tr- world's trying to do? They're trying to make us another brick in their Tower of Babel. Amen. I don't want to be a, a brick in their wall, right? The world says, we'll tell you what your self-worth is. We'll tell you, we'll tell you who you are. And we'll tell you what you're capable of. You know, when kids take these tests and they say, okay, this is what you're capable of. I don't know what grade they do that in, but they they got their map. They don't take into account the spirit of God, the the drive and the hard work and all these other intangibles. Just take a test that will tell you what you're capable of. You could never be a doctor. You could never be an engineer. You could never be a lawyer. you, You are this because we took a test. The world wants to shape you, mold you, tell you what to say, what to think, how to believe, how to talk. 
Oh, you know that one's right. <laughs> People get stumbled up. They don't want to say the wrong thing. They don't know what to say half the time. I just say the truth. Amen. There was a woman in here when I was preaching along this line one day, and she said, my brother took one of those tests when he was in school, and they told him he would never really do much academically. He went on to become a psychologist, a very, very um, a successful one. So what does the world know? You know who knows more? God knows more about you than you even know about yourself. Oh, they'll tell you, you know, we'll, 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 the world says this, your past will define you and will tell you what your future looks like. With Jesus Christ, your past does not define you. You get a new life. Amen. You get a new life. Amen. If you come to him with all of your heart, if you come to him with sincerity and heart, say, Jesus, I need you, I want you, I want a new life. I want to surrender to you. He'll give you a new life. He'll take that burden off of you and make you born again in the spirit. And even if you started on the track and you got path and you got off track, get back on track. Because God doesn't hold it against you. He's for you, not against you. But you can get on the wrong track until you go to the way of the grave and God won't stop you. Because the minute he would step in and stop you, he would have violated your will. You have to hear a word. You have to want it. You have to stand there just like the woman caught in adultery and you have to say, I want the light of life. Some people say, well, I was going the wrong way. Then God caused a car accident to stop me in my tracks. No, that's not how he speaks to people. We live in a fallen world. God does not cause accidents. Amen. So, listen to this. Our God-given destiny is not a matter of chance, but it is a matter of choice. Talking about your God-given destiny. Our destiny is determined by the decisions that we make and the wisdom that we follow. Does that make sense? Please don't be one of these people who says, well, whatever happens, happens. All came from God, so he's just trying to do this or do that. There's no power in that. There's no truth in that. There's no deliverance in that. You gotta understand that God is good, the devil's bad, and they don't change places. You have to understand that God's, the devil's desire for your life is, the, is, is death and destruction. God's is life and victory. And they don't change their mind about you. Amen. Jesus said in John 10.10, 10, it's the thief that steals, kills, and destroys. Jesus said, I've given you life and life abundantly. In Acts 10.38, he says, God anointed Jesus with the Holy Spirit and power. And he went about doing what? Good. And healing all that were sick and oppressed of who? The devil. the devil. The devil's so slick and so deceived, he can do all this destruction and all this misery and go unnoticed. Well, I'm here to tell you that there is a devil out there. And he roams around as a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. And the only way to overcome his, him is through Jesus Christ. And then rising up in faith and rising up in who you are in Christ and saying, no, not today, devil, not today. I'm going to follow the wisdom of my Lord. I'm going to follow the wisdom of the word. I'm going to hear what my pastor says. Amen. That's what we need. Look, I'm just going to read this to you. You don't have to turn there for time's sake. Romans 12, 2 says this. Don't copy the behaviors and customs of this world. Romans 12, 2. But let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. There is a will of God for all of us. It's good and it's pleasing and it's perfect. There's a will of God for all of us, is there not? He has plans for all of us. Who proves it to be true? You do. How? Don't let the world shape you, mold you, fashion you after itself. That's what they're trying to do. That's what the world's trying to do. And you know how they're trying to do it? Through persecution. Amen. 
Yeah, say, Pastor, you, you can't talk about certain things. Oh, yes, I can. You have to believe like we believe. Oh, no, I don't. I'll, I'll, I'll believe what the Word says. Amen. I'll believe what the Word says. Because this Word has withstood the test of time. And I'll love people enough to tell them the truth, and not what they want to hear only, but, but what they need to hear. Amen. Too many people out there, they'll never do anything good for anybody. They won't hurt anybody either, but they'll never do anything good either. They just sit by. The world has enough of those people. Where are the courageous people that will go out and speak the truth in love and tell people what they need to hear? Where are the people that know that they're on a mission here and they can, they can rescue people out of darkness but just by telling them the truth? I'm not talking about people ch choosing, wanting a title or a position or recognition. I'm just talking about people saying, you know what? There's a lost world out there. I know the truth. I'm going to tell them about Jesus. Boy, there's power in that. You know, I remember when I uh, worked at the tree service, I was a single parent with uh, four kids for like 10 years. It was tough, tough. <laughs> get up early, man, and just get the kids ready, go to school or magic years, and then go to work, and then come back. Do it all over again. Wouldn't change any of it because, because I did it because I love them. Amen. And, uh, but one day I was in a hurry because I had to get back to magic years because they charge you like, I don't know, some crazy amount for every five minutes you're late. Magic Years was a child care center. I don't know if it's still there or not. Nothing against them if they are. But it was a crazy amount. I had three kids in there. I'd have been signing over my paycheck. And so I, w I went up to, over to the Chambersburg dump, which is by Stevens School, right across the street. There's a bridge there. And I, and I dumped a load of chips with the bucket truck. Before you, before you dump the chips, you got to put the boom up, right? 50-foot boom, dump the chips, pull forward, put the bed down, and then one more crucial thing. You got you to gotta put the boom down, too. Well, I drove out of there and didn't put the boom down. Honestly, I got witnesses here. I hit that bridge, and I made a left, and that boom hit this big, fat telephone wire. And it lifted my whole truck up off the ground, and I just teetered there like this. Two wheels up in the air. Dad's my witness. He came and, and helped me out. That was the most embarrassing time of my life. I became the, 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 the incredible shrinking man. Because it was ready to quit in time, and all the companies were coming in at the same time, unloading their chips, and everybody wanted to know what happened and who did it and who was driving. I'm like... Could have got killed. Only thing I did when that truck was lifted up in the air, I didn't know what was happening. I said, Jesus. That's the only thing I said. I said, Jesus. And I, I'd like to see the angel that kept that truck from flipping over. Because I had my window down. I'd have been crushed. This close. But I say all that to tell you this. That in order for me to get across the bridge, there was a guy coming the other way, coming in. And he had to literally back up and for me to get across the bridge. And afterwards, he says, he says, well, I saw your boom was up. I saw. And I'm like, why didn't you tell me? Did you think I wanted to tear down every wire in Chambersburg? I, was, I wasn't happy about it. You mean you saw me. You, you could have helped me. I wouldn't have cared if he'd have called me a lughead. Say, hey, you lughead. He didn't help me. He didn't say anything. He sat there and watched a man almost lose his life. I'm not going to be that type of person. I'm not going to be that type of person. This world is hurting. They need Jesus. And if we don't give it to them, they're not going to get it. Because God has not given the gospel to be preached to the angels. He's given it to you and to me. The angels are ministering spirits sent to minister and help us, but we have to speak the word. Amen. And you can't do it if you let the world shape you and mold you, right? Now, let me say this. Satan controls the world with fear. Amen. That's what he does. The Bible says in the last days, men's hearts will fail them for fear. 
of things that are to come. Check this fear out. It's not things that are happening. They're going to, men's hearts are going to fail them because things that, that what they heard is coming or might come. But I haven't been given a spirit of fear. I've been given a spirit of power, love, and a sound mind, right? But, you know, the brain, physio, physiology, I can't even say that word, physiology, the brain, the part of the brain, um, science will tell you that fear can affect every part of your body. And it comes from dwelling in the negative, dwelling on the things. But guess what faith does? It does the opposite. And so you know what we learn to do in here? We speak the promises of God over the, pro- over the problems. Amen? We quote, quote scriptures on how much God loves us. We develop peace in our heart. We hold true to what this word says. And we build our lives on faith because the Bible says the just shall live by faith. I want to read to you this scripture. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 says, Don't you realize that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who lives in you and was given to you by God? You don't belong to yourself. God bought you with a high price. So you must honor God with your body. So here's what I'd like to do. I'd like to have prayer. It's what the Lord instructed me to do. If you're in here today and you would say, you know what? I, I need a, a, a fresh start. I need a kick start. Or maybe it's a beginning start. If you would like for me to pray for you so that you could get back up and get going, get healed and get delivered from whatever it is that's been troubling you or binding you, I want you to come up front and we're going to take the time to pray for you. And the power of God will set you free. And so if you need prayer, come up right now and we're going to pray for you right now in Jesus' name.